A celestial boat, an airship, manifests itself out of nowhere, the clouds. Today, the 27th of January 2014, above the City Hall Square of Lillestad, Flevoland, the Netherlands, also called the Lowlands because it is plus minus 18 feet on the sea level. We live in between dikes. The statue you just saw is of the engineer Lilly. He transformed the former Zuider Sea into land. On board of the airship are the goddesses and gods from the tenth planet, Nibiru. Now they arrive at Lelystad Haven, where Arya and the host of the art club, being flabbergasted, then welcomes them with a big smile. Their heavenly light shines through the roof. Further they sail on their way to the rising sun, into boundless destinations, dimensions dissolving in the aurora borealis. Yacht Club and everyone in the world who will see this wonderful production we will do tonight. Thank you, Kuhn, to be here with us tonight. Thank you all for being here with us tonight. What you just saw, this wonderful animation made by Felix Guerin and his student Robert, uh, this tells a story, and the story behind this is that in the 19th century um, manifested itself uh, f from 1896 to 1897 above the United States flying ships, so I call them celestial ships, and uh, all over the United States, different places, different uh, states, they were seen, and uh, the people were flabbergasted. They have also been seen above Paris, and they also have been seen above London. And um, so in this wonderful book, Dimensions, which has been written by Jacques Vallée, uh, he mentioned the whole story about this, uh, about this manifestation of those flying ships, the celestial boats, I call them, in this beautiful animation, um, what is it what you are dealing with? So that's my first question to you, uh, Kuhn. What is this? What's happening here? Guido, you know much more about this than I do. Um, but if you talk about this period, uh, people did have the, um, the balloons. Huh? Yeah. They were present, so it was probably something different. Yes. And so what... Uh, Jacques Vallée, astronomer, says in his book, he put some uh, three, four pages on this subject, he says that uh, he feels that uh, the, the UFO problem, uh, you have to, to, to look at it from different uh, points of view, and in his opinion, uh, he says that they come from other dimensions. So uh, those boats, those flying boats, you know, he says they probably, maybe certainly, come from other dimensions. What do you feel about it? I think it's uh, probably true. Um, if you look at it from their perspective, you probably see that it's only technology that they are using. For us, it's magic. But if you don't know the technology, everything is like what a magician does. It's, it's, you, you are flabbergasted. But I think it's just technology and, and dimensional shifts and... Uh, Cloaking is something that they uh, can easily use. Like we use a mobile telephone nowadays, and when you go with your mobile mm -hmm. telephone into the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. you will probably be burned at the stake. 
because the people of that era don't understand the technology. And I think today's scientists have the same feeling about UFOs. They don't take it seriously because they don't understand the technology. Yes. So now, uh, in your book, this is a wonderful book, UFOs bestaan gewoon. The translation is uh, UFOs exist certainly. Yeah. Is, it, is that maybe if there comes a translation, there will be a translation. Mm -hmm. How are you going to translate this, the title of the book in the English language? Do you already know that? Well, it could be something like Simply Exist. The reason why I called um, the book UFO Simply Exist is because um, many people still think that UFOs are nonsense. And many people from my profession, and you should think about um, pilots and uh, air traffic controllers, but also uh, um, astronauts, they have seen such remarkable things in the sky and in space that they want to be heard. And they know that the UFO phenomenon is a serious phenomenon. And um, so now I think it's time for us to go beyond the... The, the, the thing that you have to explain that UFOs are a serious topic. You, show, you should go beyond that. You should go towards why are UFOs seen in the sky? What are they? Um, how does it work? And there should be a, a profound debate on the topic. That's the, the main reason for writing my book. Yes, so now I have to come back to uh, what Jacques Vallée says about other dimensions. So I think you uh, write in your book that, in your opinion, they come from other dimensions and also from the universe we live in. Mm -hmm. So how do you see that? Well, for, for most people, uh, other dimensions are um, uh, one step beyond what they can comprehend. Uh, I think it's true. Other dimensions exist and they can use other dimensions to travel. Uh, of course, we live in an Einsteinian world, uh, universe, basically, where it says that you cannot go faster than the speed of uh, light, which is probably not true. And uh, again, if you have the technology to go beyond the uh, superluminous speeds, then it's not a big problem to come from another star system to here. Um, but that's something for science is very difficult to, uh, to comprehend. So in one of the little clips we will see, uh, Stanton Friedman, I had in my program 14 years ago, mm -hmm. he will give some explanation about, uh, about those technology. Uh, uh, the technology and how to move around in the universe. Right. So now I feel that maybe we should get to the next clip. Okay. Well, what kind of technology the they system. use to, to, uh, to move? Well, I worked on advanced nuclear and space systems for 14 years as a nuclear physicist, classified programs. And the first thing you have to say about going to the stars is you have to select, so where are we going? I prefer to look just at our local neighborhood, within 54 light years of here, just down the street. There are a thousand stars of which 46 are similar to the sun. So I'm not interested in across our galaxy, which is 80,000 light years across. I'm not interested in the next big galaxy over, which is a million light years away. That's a different kind of problem. I'm interested in the local neighborhood. So the place I'm particularly interested in getting to, two stars, which Jaime can see and the rest of us can't, Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli, the constellation of reticulum, 37 light years away that's just down the street. Those two stars are less than a light year apart. They're both sun-like stars, and they're a billion years older than the sun. And recognition of their special characteristics came about because of a very famous UFO sighting where a star map was observed. So that's the first thing. I'm not talking about going to another galaxy or across our own. Secondly, we have to recognize that at one g acceleration, the force of gravity right here now, it takes less just about a year to get close to the speed of light. Not a hundred years, not a thousand years, just about one year. Secondly, we have to note that we have already, in America anyway, operated nuclear propulsion systems. A nuclear rocket engine that would fit on this table if it were strong enough, that puts out a power of 4,400 megawatts, twice the power of the old Grand Cooley Dam. That's a lot of energy in a small space. That was operated in the late 1960s. That's nuclear fission, what goes on on nuclear submarines, nuclear power plants. 
In the early 1960s, I worked on nuclear fusion propulsion system. That's the most important source of energy in all our lives, because the sun up there is a mass of fusioning uh, particles, if you will. It's not a mass of burning gas. It's nuclear fusion is producing the energy. If we use the right things in the right way and kick particles out the back end of a fusion rocket that have 10 million times as much energy per particle as you can get in a chemical rocket, 10 million. Now, this doesn't mean I think aliens use fission or fusion, but only that we know how to do it if you want to spend the money. I'm not saying we should. I think we have other problems to take care of first. The key thing here is Friedman's Law, named by me for me, <laughs> immodestly. And that is that technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future is not an extension of the past. You have to change how you do things. Lasers aren't better light bulbs. Different physics. Micro-integrated circuits in our computers are not small vacuum tubes. They work by different physics. The nuclear rocket engines are not just better chemical engines. The reason I bring this up, I mentioned Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli are a billion years older than the sun. So if somebody out there somewhere got started a little bit before we did, on his or her technological kick, they're going to know some things that we don't know. All you have to do is look back 100 years and look at what we know now that we didn't know then. So I expect that they work by techniques about which we know nothing, but I should bring in something else. Einstein showed that as you get close to the speed of light, a billion kilometers an hour roughly, Time slows down for the things moving that fast. How much? Well, it depends on how fast you go. At 99.99% of the speed of light, and we make particles that go faster than that in accelerators, 99.999999. But at just 99.99% of the speed of light, you can go 37 light years in six months pilot time. You go out, come back, marry your grandchild's best friend, go out, come back, repeat the process. It's the gift of immortality. So. People think Einstein is what limits us. It's quite the reverse. Now, one must be very, very careful about claims by astronomers who are pushing listening for radio signals, but who say nobody's coming here because you can't get here from there. In the past, their calculations about spaceflight have been invariably seriously in error because it's an engineering problem and they don't know the details of the engineering. So nuclear fusion would be would be very nice, and it would do the job. But I think they know things that we don't know. Because even if they're only a 1,000 years ahead of us, just look back a 100 or a 1,000 years and say, uh, things today are magic for yesterday. I have a digital wristwatch. Mm -hmm. Nobody could have duplicated that 70 years ago. Yeah. They know it kept time and it had a battery, but they couldn't have made another one because they couldn't analyze the chip. <coughs> so. Technology is something we have to be very careful about saying it's impossible. Every generation of ancient academics has thought it knew all there was to know. And the next generation comes along and proves them wrong. Mm -hmm. You can't go faster than the speed of sound, they said during World War II. Well, not with a propeller-driven airplane, but we use jets. <laughs> Okay, uh, cool. What is your reaction to what he's saying? He's a very smart guy and he's been working on the UFO problem all his life. And I, I totally agree with him. I think um, uh, if you look at the technology, I just mentioned the Middle Ages. Uh, it's only a few hundred years and look what we can do now with technology. So absolutely, when there is a civilization that is uh, 100,000 years ahead of us, they know the tricks, which we don't. And uh, so he's right, uh, he worked on nuclear fission uh, engines and they were there in the 60s, so maybe they are used by uh, earthlings, but um, <clears throat> I don't think that is the technology that they use because I think they really can go beyond the speed of light. Yes. And they, if, if they use other dimensions, then what is time? Mm -hmm. what, what, what do we know about it? We don't. Yeah. Um, if I listen to him, uh, what he said about the uh, scientists who have no clue about yes. all this, then Professor van der Kooi, he was an astronomer in Utrecht some 60 years ago, and he said, we will never get into space. Mm. 
and I think then half year later, then the Sputnik was turning around. Yes, absolutely. Around the yeah. Earth. Yeah. Um, the same goes for the, the 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 Royal Academy in London. <clears throat> at the end of the 1800s, when they said, well, men uh, heavier than uh, air vehicles can never fly. Mm -hmm. And only three or four years later, the Wright brothers uh, took off at uh, Kitty Hawk. Yeah, that's the same. Kitty Hawk, eh? I mean, that's. Um, I think it's very arrogant to, to claim that you know uh, that your technology is the best there ever will be. And even now, if, if you look at uh, computer technology and all other kinds of, of technologies that are being developed right now, most professors are not able to keep up with the speed of their students. So uh, please be, be very um, uh, modest about what you are doing here, what you can comprehend. So uh, you're talking about students and you, you teach <coughs> at the university in Delft and uh, technology of space, right? Uh, so I, I, I think I uh, remember that you were taken on this path about UFOs and all the technology. Can you say something about it? Well, I, I gave lectures for first-year students and uh, since the 2008 uh, I call them the YouTube generation uh, because uh, around then you could get, easily could get little films, little clips from uh, crashing aircraft and I'm, I'm, I'm virtually uh, um, uh, mainly an uh, aerospace uh, structures and materials man. So I asked them, please send me films of uh, crashing aircraft because we can learn a lot about what is happening there. So that's very uh, instructive for students. But every now and then there was this little clip from NASA uh, sh shot out of the space shuttle with uh, small orbs going about and the crew talking about uh, alien spacecraft or unidentified flying objects talking to the to the, the ground station and I don't think they were joking about it they were really serious and they were following the orbs with the camera and of course students should ask uh, Mr. Vermeer and what are we seeing here what is this and why don't we know about it so I asked my colleagues and they said well it's probably nothing and I thought well that's, that's very unsatisfying so I dug into it deep and uh, discovered that uh, this is really a very big world behind it, which we don't know. And I think it's time in our progress as a civilization that we should take the, the next step in our development. We've got enough, enough problems in this world that could be solved with the technology that is probably in our space and in our, uh, in our skies. That we can see that what UFOs are doing, eh? and I'm talking about uh, uh, flying very fast, uh, making right angles with high speed. Um, hovering silently, um, appearing and disappearing uh, in, in seconds, well, you, may, you name it. Yeah, okay, now, uh, he was talking about our neighborhood, you know, yes. and, and going as fast, uh, almost as fast as the speed of light. So the, uh, the theme for today is meet with the neighbors. Right, and we have a lot of neighbors. <laughs> we have a lot of neighbors, yeah. and, and we will get there later on when we talk mm. about uh, Paul Hellyer. But l let's go um, to the next uh, clip. Right. Is that a good idea? Absolutely. Now, on uh, September 1991, uh, from the Discovery shuttle, they were able to record these coming out of the air. What is it? This is coming from inside the earth and going outside the earth. <laughs> and yes, the astronaut is interested in this object. What is it? It is like transparent, like plasma, or organic, and empty. Hovering over Mexico City. In this object, you see these three kind of movements. One is left to right, the other is hovering, and the other is rotating. You see all the details from the video. Everything tells me that it's right. Again, the first time I saw it, I thought this was a hoax. Because when something is so clear, it's not, nothing in the middle. Either this is a hoax, or is the, is, this is the thing. If this video is real, then we have to accept this phenomenon is real. There is no, nothing in the middle. Then 
That's why this man didn't come out into the open. Because we are not ready yet to accept something like this. Then what would happen to him? He would have been destroyed completely. Completely. Otherwise, we would have to accept the video. And if we are not going to do that, it's very dangerous now to do it. If you have something that is nothing in the middle, cannot be said, well, it's a balloon, well, something else. And it's so clear, you could be destroyed. So did you ever see a UFO? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. Not, not as bright as this one. Uh, it's very, very spectacular. Um, but I did see some orbs, and I think I also saw a cylinder some day. It was a very bright day, uh, clear skies, and I thought what I thought was a fuselage, but I didn't see the wings, which is quite odd for, mm -hmm. <laughs> for a fuselage in our world without wings. Um, but I've seen many orbs uh, over the years, yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what was the impression? What did it do with you? Oh, you, you're st you start to shout, uh, oh, they're here, they're here. <laughs> and you, you, don't, you don't grab for your photo camera because it's, it's not something that comes to your mind. It, you are so uh, enthusiastic about what you see yeah. that you f completely forget about. Uh, and of course, it's usually it's only a few seconds or maybe half a minute. Yeah. And uh, so it's over before you know it. Okay, so now maybe uh, I should tell a story about Australia where I lived. And so I, w I, I built their uh, double deck strains. And so one evening I came home, a little village, you know, and my wife was completely confused. I said, what, what's going on? What happened to you? And she said, half an hour ago, I went out in the garden and so you could look there very far. Yeah. And she said, then I saw a UFO or a spaceship, you know, flying vehicle. And she saw it for 20, 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she, she told me something very special about it. She said it, it, it was like it was gold, mm -hmm. a golden glow on it. And, uh, and then she said, I got a feeling of goodness, of right. great goodness. And so maybe later on, we, we get back to the goodness. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at Hollywood, yeah. and I, I've been there many times, then they make lots of movies where the extraterrestrials are painted like they yeah. are... Evil. Uh, 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 yeah, evil. Uh, evil. Pure evil, yeah. yeah. So now, uh, except for ET, yes, Spielberg's ET is very. Uh, oh yeah, benign. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and maybe I should say something about it too, that um, the book uh, on the edge of reality by uh, Alan Hynek, mm -hmm. th this has been taken by Spielberg as the basis for his movie, uh, Close Encounters yes. of the Third Kind. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, and Professor um, um, Sitchin, we will see him later, mm -hmm. uh, in my last interview with him, I asked him, wouldn't it be wonderful if your first book, The, uh, the Twelfth Planet, uh, if that would be filmed? Mm -hmm. And so I said, I have a connection to him. And he said, I have some connections too. So Spielberg, he knows about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. let's go to the next yep. clip. In 1992, someone was recording this object that is strange by itself. When he realized that over his head he had something like 18 spheres, they were moving all together. As you see, but they never lose the formation. Even if they move, the formation remains the same. They are moving, they are advancing again. They are passing over, they are not going up. No, they are going parallel to the ground. The camera is to the scene. And then you can see this object releasing one of these spheres here. On October 21st, 
before 1994, we had more than 30 spheres, but now they are standing still. I don't know if any skeptical has an explanation for this. They don't move, and they make figures. They make triangles, as you see. This is daytime. This is 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And this was the first video we received with this kind of event, because just six weeks later, we received this video from a different uh, state, Tamaulipas again. And you see, they, they make a figure. It's like the crop circles, but in the sky. Mr. Massam. So what, what kind of impression does this make on you? Um, one would like to live in Mexico, eh? because there's a lot of things going on there. And uh, Jaime Mosan is very famous for his television show, in which he is still today, and uh, well, these clips are from 94, but still today he talks about many sightings of different kind of UFOs in, in Mexico. So the people are more open to it uh, there in the first place. And uh, second, also the authorities take it seriously. Yeah. And so you can call in your observations and there are people investigating it. So, um, but these spheres are very special, of course, because uh, they, they appear during the daytime, many, many of them uh, at the same time. And some skeptic may say it's, it's balloons, but that's clearly not the, the same thing because sometimes they, they hover uh, about and back. And uh, well, if, if you have a wind, they just go the same direction, of course. And uh, well, this is not the case here. Yeah, so in this uh, documentary, he's saying about uh, a day uh, in uh, Mexico that about 200 uh, pilots, they reported to the authorities about UFOs having almost collisions with right. them, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, this is one reason which I think is, is very important to, uh, to take seriously, because airspace safety is very much involved here because pilots may, uh, like uh, in, in, in last summer, uh, over London, uh, over Heathrow, a pilot was really scared about a cylinder coming up to him. And even if a pilot makes a mistake that he sees something which is not there, then still it is important to investigate. And uh, aircraft safety is something which is very important. In Mexico, sometimes there were reports about UFOs hitting the undercarriage of the aircraft. Well, then you have a big problem. Uh, usually, I think uh, the UFO pilots are they terrestrial or extraterrestrial? We still don't know, of course, but they are very skilled pilots, so it, it's yeah. very seldom that they, they hit anything of a plane. But um, yes, if, if, I didn't know of this story about 200 pilots reporting UFOs, but uh, yes, it, it's very important in the first place for pilots to report something they, which they see, because they are trained uh, observers. They, they have to rely on their, uh, on their eyes and on their instruments to see whether something is important for flight safety. So if they report something en masse, we as a society have a problem if we don't listen to pilots. Same goes for air traffic controllers. Eh? You, you probably heard that over Bremen a few weeks yes, ago. Yes. There was a total airfield uh, put still. Um, all, all flights suspended because there was a UFO hovering three hours over the runway. Which is, well, they don't take it lightly, eh? because if you have to divert traffic, that involves hundreds or thousands of people who have to go to another airfield. It's very costly, so people there uh, rely on their radar and on their eyes. So if they make a decision like this, they don't do it uh, just because they want to be pranks or they, they take their jobs very seriously, I think. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, now uh, when I remember what I we just saw, uh, some people say it reminds me of crop circles, you know, there's okay. a certain pattern in there and maybe a pattern of a star system, maybe trying that they try to make something clear, you know, what's going on in these days. What do, what do you think about that? About crop circles? Yeah, crop circles, or but also the, uh, pattern, the messages which, that they send, which, yeah. Which, which, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not an expert uh, in, in this field. I, I do know that uh, in, in Wiltshire, for example, where many crop circles each year are found, that they see a lot of UFOs during the summer. So there is probably a connection. Most expert witnesses there and most people who are uh, investigating crop circles for many decades of years, they say, say that, that there is a lot going on also with UFOs over crop circles. So I think it's worthwhile investigating it. Um. Jaime Mossan, he, he tells us in this program about February 2000, 
And so I interviewed uh, them, those uh, people uh, on the, 20, the 24th of March in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. He said in February, a gigantic UFO starship came down in Mexico and has been seen by many, many, many people. And it was in the radio frequency and then in all the newspapers. Oh, Jaime Mosson, he is right. He's mm -hmm. telling us years and years. And now about all the people in Mexico City, they see it. Right. Let's get to the next yeah. clip. I suppose. Is there a relationship between the mathematics of the pyramid and the U of O phenomenon? To tell you the truth, uh, I don't know, but I think uh, I can speculate on it because, as you mentioned, Mexico has more, more than 100,000 sites of ruins. Probably is the country with most pyramids in the world. And now is the country with more sightings in the world. As Zakaria said a little bit ago, uh, that uh, must be a relation of these two things. I mean, if you have all cultures, all legacies, and if they are coming back according to all prophecies, because there are prophecies around this, after the eclipse of July 11, 1991, we discovered that in the Dresde Codex, they said more than a thousand years ago that after this eclipse would be the time of the meeting with the masters of the stars. And probably Zachariah can join this there are other possibilities, of course. The volcanoes, we have many active volcanoes, and many, many sightings are around volcanoes, especially when they are very active. We have discovered that every time we have a, 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 an important sighting close to the volcano Popocatépetl, we are going to have an eruption. And people know that now. I, if we have this sighting and it's presented in television, everybody takes care of that because something is going to happen. Yes. Uh, do you have any knowledge about volcanoes and, and sightings? And <laughs> we learn a lot in Delft, but not about volcanoes and not about history. So, like Jamie Moisan, I think you have to speculate about it. I've, of course, I read all the books of Sitchin, and some people like him. Um, and I think it's fascinating, and I do uh, concur with their conclusion, that we do not know much about our history. And that what we take for truth about our history is probably not true and should be investigated much more, especially, like he says, they have so many ancient sites and so many pyramids uh, combined with their sightings of UFOs, and uh, there, there is a connection, no doubt. But what is it? It's yeah, fascinating. What, what is it? So talking yeah. about volcanoes yeah. and UFOs, so there's a, a, maybe an interesting story I would like to tell. In 1997, I was in Quito, uh, in Ecuador, and there I met a, a priest, even of Zanovelli. He was taking care of the poorest children in Quito, and he did a wonderful job. And he told me, Guido, I don't like the Vatican. And uh, so I gave him this uh, DVD. And so before I went to his office, I was in the, in the hotel, and there was a big poster and I saw on the poster a volcano and uh, the Tungurahua. So I wondered what the name, wh what it meant, Tungurahua. And uh, so then uh, uh, an hour later, I was sitting in his office and I gave him the DVD and he said, I'm very happy with mm -hmm. this because it's a very good DVD. And, uh, and, and then I, I gave him also a poem, The Unibird, and it's about uh, two birds getting one bird. Uh, I'm not going to tell you right now, but we will put it in the, in the, uh, in the movie later on, in the documentary. And it's about two birds, two eagles meeting each other, getting apart, uniting, and so on. He says, this is also about UFOs, mm -hmm. about spaceships coming to the to the earth and leaving again, coming to the earth. And then he said to me, now you, you gave me those two things, come with me to my secretary. 
and so he put on second the, he put on the the, the 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 computer and then i saw a volcano the tungurahua and so i said what does that mean so he told me and uh, and then he he enlarged the screen you know the the, the objects on the screen and i saw four or five ufos flying above the volcano so and what uh, what does it mean what does it mean yeah, yeah well, um, uh, oh yes, he says that about, he says about this that is lots of magnetic energy and mm -hmm. power. Mm -hmm. So for some reason they come there and maybe they they go into the volcano to, to the center of the earth. Why not? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe now is the time to tell us about the the the, the this lake here where we are, Marker Lake. And um, there are, there's at, at least one person here in, in the yacht club, and he was with some people coming before there was the, the railway. He was with people, some people coming on the bus to uh, uh, to Ladystad from Amsterdam. And then the, the bus driver he stopped the uh, the bus, and the, he, he said, "Come out, come outside." And they saw. A spaceship, UFO, going on the water, and so then I've been here on the on the on the on the, on the TV here, and so and this radio we, we did a program, and uh, um, so then I I, I put the, the the thought there, could it be that under the Marker Lake is a is a sp space base for, for mm -hmm. UFOs? Could it be? Maybe. Do you have any comments on this? <laughs> no, no. It no. would be fascinating, but then I probably... You should have many more people seeing things here on the lake. Yeah. And not just on one occasion. No, no, there's Because more people. what I heard from Jamie was that they, yeah. they, they see UFOs uh, about the uh, Popocatapetl all the time. Yeah. Especially when exactly. it erupts, yeah. which, which, says which yeah. happens a lot of the time. Yeah. yeah. So mm. UFOs and, uh, and volcanoes have something to do yeah. with each other. Yeah. Why? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, let's go to the next movie. Many uh, effects of flying saucers, if you will. I prefer flying saucers because all flying saucers are UFOs. Very few UFOs are flying saucers, and I'm only interested in the ones that are. Uh, one of the many physical effects are automobile stoppages. There are two different reports. One has 400 cases, one has 300 cases on record of car engines and uh, lights and radios and stuff in automobiles going out. The famous case uh, in Texas, level in Texas, where half a dozen motorists reported to the sheriff that their car engine went off and they saw this bright egg-shaped object on the road ahead of them. Half a dozen different people calling the sheriff's department. These were people who didn't know each other. Uh, so it happened there, Dr. James E. McDonald, who was one of the world's top uh, UFO investigators, has interviewed over 500 witnesses. That's a lot of investigation. He checked those cases out. His congressional testimony alone was 71 pages long. He covers 41 sightings. Jim was top notch. Uh, there are similar cases of, I'll call it electromagnetic effects, on aircraft. Dr. Richard Haynes, a scientist retired now from NASA, has collected more than 3,500 pilot sightings. And in at least 200 of these cases, there are effects on systems of the airplane, the compass going wild, communication systems turning off, automatic guidance, you know, a lot of different electromagnetic systems on board an aircraft. Uh, and these are with experienced pilots, military and commercial. So effects on systems. Okay. Do you have any? Well, this is very interesting, and again, flight safety uh, is again uh, involved. Huh? I mean, if you uh, are operating uh, in your aircraft and something happens and your instruments yeah. go offline, then you really have a problem, especially nowadays when, when aircraft are fully computerized and you can't even fly an aircraft without a fully operational uh, computer. So if you have interference, and you hear, you hear a lot of these stories where there is interference, some, some of the interference is unwanted, so maybe it goes by accident, 
but you probably also heard about the many cases where uh, UFOs were sighted over um, uh, missile uh, bases, where nuclear missiles were uh, mm -hmm. stationed, uh, where they uh, saw a UFO over the base, which is highly classified and very much off limits. And one by one, all the missiles were um, shut off. Uh, of course, the Americans, and le later we learned that also the Russians uh, got these kinds of encounters, and of course they were not amused. Um, so there is, this, this is probably a wanted uh, interference with technology. Um, yeah, so um, could you say they care about us because of this? That's, well, you mentioned just earlier that, that some, well, basically many uh, witnesses of, of especially close encounters, eh? if, you, if you have a close encounter where um, a UFO is very close by or maybe even people seeing uh, visitors, that they got this feeling of, of peace and, and love, basically. Um, so you hear that many times. Um, and also the, document, uh, the documents that, that Robert Hastings collected, he investigated the relations between UFOs and the nuclear uh, power plants and nuclear arms. Um, he says that uh, there's a very good chance that they are looking after us because many people, especially <coughs> technical people, don't know, but nuclear technology is very harmful for not only for people, for the whole planet, for the whole ecosystem. Uh, so what is now happening at Fukushima, is, is, it's not in the newspaper, it's not on television, but it's very devastating what's going on there. The, all these, these power plants leaking uh, radioactive material in the soil and in the water, uh, not to mention in the air. Um, and, and they probably, and, and Jim Marsh, one of the investigators, uh, called it, um, when they saw at Kitty Hawk the first, no, it wasn't at Kitty Hawk, it was in New Mexico in the desert, when the first new, uh, atomic bomb went off, mm -hmm. uh, just before they threw them on Japan, um, that the, probably they could see it from a distance, the enormous mushroom cloud and the enormous light that came off that the, the visitors probably thought, oh my God, the kids have found the matches. <laughs> Which means that, that they found out how to destroy the entire planet and the whole uh, human civilization. And uh, the, the fact uh, is still here that uh, even in 2014, we, well, as far as we know, we still have not seen the use of a nuclear bomb on human beings since the Second World War ended. Um, not to mention, of course, that, uh, that well, humanity tried more than 2,000 uh, bombs on small islands in, high in the air and, and deep into the sea just to see what the things could do. Yeah. Okay, now, um, Einstein, he said once that uh, if we would have had the Third World War, mm. then maybe the next war will be fought with baseball bats or something, yeah. which, uh, uh, yeah, could be possible. If you are primitive again, you know, mm -hmm. back to the Stone Age. Um, so now, when we look at the, uh, at the books by uh, Sitchin, uh, several books of Sitchin here on the table, Sitchin was a, uh, he was a, uh, a sumerologist, and an historian, and uh, he wrote about the Sumerians, and um, he said from the Sumerian clay tablets, he learned that 450,000 years ago, the Anunnaki from the 10th planet uh, came to the earth and to mine gold, <coughs> and I, I just heard today about uh, a scientist who investigated those Anunnaki mines in South Africa, mm -hmm. and he seems to do, he, he seems to have wonderful findings and totally new things discovering. And so then Sitchin says that 300,000 years ago they created the Lulu Amelu, primitive worker, us, uh, by uh, messing around with DNA yeah. and genetic um, energy and so on and so on. Now, um, now we, many people, some people, special scientists, they see those gods as uh, uh, from from mythology. That that's all fairy tales. They never existed. So now, say for instance that and it will never happen. 
that the third world war would be created. Eh? We would be stupid enough to do, to, to do this. We were not, not that stupid. Then um, maybe uh, some two, three, four thousand years you know, from now, then when they see the remnants of this society and find something in, in, on which, in which we stored our information and who we are, maybe they will also say, say that we are, uh, that, 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 that this is about mythology and uh, spacecraft and uh, big airplanes never existed. So, so what do you think? What do you well, if, if you think, uh, for instance, about uh, Atlantis, which they claim was a very high civilization, a very high in technology, uh, what we can find now is basically some remnants maybe in the Atlantic Ocean, which they are still finding now. They, they find pyramids and, and, and structures on the water. Um, but we don't find technology like we have. Eh? You, you would anticipate that um, if you have this disaster of a third world war, that you would probably find uh, computers and all kinds of machinery, aircraft, cars, uh, stuff like that. But um, amazingly enough, we only find stone structures from periods like in Sumer and, and befo before that, um, which some of uh, the scientists that studied it claimed that were a very high civilization, which had already the possibility of space travel, which had connections with people from other s planets, from other stars. Um, we don't see that. So the, the question is, what happens really when, when you destroy a f an entire civilization? I also heard about technology that exists to, to remove everything uh, from that technology from the planet of the Earth just by vaporizing it or uh, there are also, you probably refer to what Sitchin is uh, saying about uh, glazed cities where probably there was such a high temperature, maybe from nuclear bombs that were able, like we saw in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, that could vaporize everything living and dead but maybe the temperature was so high that, that silicon just made a glass layer on top of the soil. Well, so, I think that's possible. So one of the best uh, examples is Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. And uh, several scientists say that was n nuclear uh, mm -hmm. uh, weapons yeah. used. Uh, or even worse than that, what do we know? Yeah. Scalar weapons, uh, what they are trying to do now. Of course, we are a planet which is famous for uh, using a lot of money and resources like people and smart kids to make new weapons. Yeah. That's what we, go what we are good at. Yeah, so in, in those areas, yeah. Sitchin found and other uh, researchers that some areas were very highly radioactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we should uh, not have this third world war. We will not. We will no. not have it. Better not. Uh, next clip. Back to the drawing board. Don't they know that this system doesn't work for some of these systems? In other words, it, it's interesting. There's a philosophical question here, you see. Uh, our approach, uh, typically an American approach, and I'm an American and a Canadian, so I can be troublesome to both, is shoot first, ask questions later. The aliens very often seems, seem to cause things to stop, including people in a number of abduction cases People are controlled, if you will, uh, without being hurt. They're stopped. They can't move. They can breathe. They're still breathing. But that's a kind of a nice way of preventing somebody from doing something you don't want to do mm -hmm. rather than shooting them, which is uh, the American way. So uh, f physical effects, a classic case was in Iran. So this is uh, about stoppage of, of people. Uh, and uh, cars and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So now I don't know exactly uh, what will we have in the next clip. Is this Sitchin yeah. talking about yeah. stopping of the earth? Yeah. Okay. Well, the yeah. So maybe should, we mm. should look at the next <laughs> clip. Yeah. You asked uh, the effects about uh, plane stopping, right. car stopping. What about the earth stopping? Yeah, that's it. Now, you, your question started with the, not all the Mexican pyramids, but the main ones in Teotihuacan, the pyramid of the sun, the pyramid of the moon. And according to the lore and legends connected with their construction, it had to do 
with the day when the sun failed to rise. The night continued for 20 hours longer than it should have. The, the day that the, the, the sun didn't move. When we say that the sun didn't rise, we actually mean that the earth stopped rotating, right? The interesting thing for me, and I mentioned that the, all this ancient and modern, perhaps, UFO evidence is corroboration of the Bible. Now, we have in the Bible the tale that when the Israelites began the conquest of Canaan, the land of Israel, uh, and that there was a time when one of the battles was very difficult, and the sun did not set a whole day to enable the Israelites to vanquish the enemy. No one was able until now, not even me, to, to explain what happened, how come the sun failed to set for 20 hours to enable the battle to continue until it was won. And when I came to investigating the Americas and Mexico and South America and came across this tale connected with the construction of the two pyramids in Teotihuacan, it dawned on me that they are talking about the same phenomenon, that when the sun did not set on one side of the world, it did not rise on the other side of the world for the same 20 hours. Yeah. The question then was, did this happen at the same time? <clears throat> because we know the time of Joshua, the conquest was around 1400 BC. And it turns out that in South America, <coughs> in the Andes, the same story is found in the local native lore of a day when the sun did not rise until the gods got together and found a solution. So, and that is also dated to about the same time. So your question about the pyramids and <coughs> the stoppage of movement yeah. goes beyond stopping of a car or a plane, perhaps. It goes to a day when the earth stopped rotating and it has to do on one hand with the conquest of Canaan and with the other with that place that you asked about in Mexico called Teotihuacan, which literally means the city or place of the God. So there is this story that um, planes were forbidden to fly above the pyramids. Maybe it still is this way. And do you know something about this? No, no. So, uh, what is your comment on the uh, stopping <laughs> of the Earth? <laughs> My official explanation is it's not possible. So it's all myth. It's all myth. It's people yeah. making things up. Yeah. But if you investigate the UFO phenomenon and you go from the UFOs to ancient gods, to our perception of history, uh, to technology, to all kinds of things, um, the cover-up of UFOs, the things that we are not allowed to know, um, then you, sh you should st stop saying things are impossible. So I think it's possible. I just don't know how. Mm -hmm. And there's no explanation. Also, Sitchin doesn't give an explanation. He says just, no, well, this is, this is oh, everywhere in the world. No. They have this story. Are they all making it up at the same time? Yeah. Well, that's, that's very unlikely. So especially we, we, we tend to, to look at ancient people like they are some kind of retarded people. But that's, that's really very arrogant. It's a very bad attitude. So uh, you better conclude that you don't understand everything and you should do investigation. And it's not easy, of course, and it's not nice because some of your own ideas may be wrong. And that is one of the problems of science nowadays. And, and it's going on for many, many decades. And we are educating our young students in the same way that they think when they go out of college that they think they know everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is only the start for your own investigation. And, and please don't think that you understand things, because even the constants we, which we use in, in physics are not constant. They change over time. Yeah. So what is a constant? Mm -hmm. uh, there is nobody in the university that can explain what is an electron or what is a photon. They just don't know. They have models and theories about it. But after a while, if you don't question the theory or the model, you just think it's true. So who am I to say that the Earth could not stop for a moment? 
Mm. I just don't know which hand took it at that moment. Yes. <clears throat> um, now, uh, look, look, maybe you should look at the next, next clip. Technically, it is the, a tenth planet, one more beyond Pluto, which is, according to the Sumerians, the twelfth member of the twelfth solar member. system. Sun, moon, and ten planets. So when my first book was published, and I mentioned that it was uh, a quarter of a century ago, and it is becoming more and more a classic taught at colleges and universities by now, the publisher said a title that would say the 10th planet, which is the 12th member. Right. Let's call it the 12th planet. Let's go. So as a planet, it's the 10th. As a member of the solar system, it's the 12th. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's a very interesting what he's saying. Because if you uh, read the uh, Sumerian clay tablets, then um, the Anunnaki, they called the, the planet Earth, from their point of view, coming from outside, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they, they went outside our solar system, the seventh planet. Mm -hmm. And we call the planet Earth the third planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I what remember, does it tell us? I remember the Dogon people. Yeah. You probably know that story. And from, from many years ago, they already knew that Sirius, Sirius A and B, uh, is a two-star system or even a three-star system. But Sirius B cannot be seen with the naked eye. And they already know about Sirius B, well, which is impossible according to science nowadays. So it's only after the discovery of, 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 of sophisticated telescopes that we found out that Sirius has multiple stars. And, uh, well, uh, uh, who can explain this? Nobody can. So we just ignore it. This is the best way to, uh, to treat the, the, the things that you don't understand. Yeah. Just ignore it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think the, the universe obeys to the, always to the laws we made for it. No, that's, that's, that's very disappointing, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now um, we had the plan, and the plan still exists, to have uh, uh, to Skype tonight with Paul Tellier, uh, Andre Kuipers, and Edgar Mitchell. Mm -hmm. uh, you know Edgar Mitchell. Well, he was present through Skype uh, at my book presentation yeah. in March uh, last year, and uh, which was a mystery in itself because um, uh, we were doing that at the meisjes house, the girls' house in Delft. Um, which had a very ancient kind of uh, Wi-Fi. <laughs> okay. So basically, we, when we tried it out, um, the Skype got some uh, audio connection, but not a very good video connection. Because we were very disturbed that, that the whole thing uh, that night when Edgar was going to be present there was going to be a fiasco. But maybe the gods interfered, because when Edgar um, called... There was perfect audio and video, Wonderful. So, <laughs> Wonderful. which was basically physically impossible. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we, we hope uh, we will uh, talk with yeah. all those people yeah. uh, later on, you know, and put it in the documentary. And uh, so... Well, the uh, amazing thing, of course, about Edgar Mitchell is that he is the sixth man on the moon. So yeah. we, 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 we try to, to talk to him because he's very special, eh? especially for aerospace students and aerospace staff. Everybody likes people who have been on the moon which is ages ago, by the way, we never seem to went back. Um, and he, he says, his message is, well, UFOs exist, UFOs are partly, not everyone, but partly uh, extraterrestrial, yeah. and the other ones are terrestrial. Yeah. Uh, the governments know this, but they don't tell us about it. Mm -hmm. But that's his story, and yeah. nobody listens to him. I think that's incredible. <laughs> uh, okay, now we get to Paul Tellier. So uh, hopefully we will Skype with him and mm -hmm. you will be there and so on and so on. Paul Hellier, you met him. Yeah, Paul Hellier. Paul Hellier. Paul Hellier. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, Paul Hellier. He's an, um, a former uh, Minister of uh, Defense of Canada. He's very old by now, <laughs> uh, but very alive and kicking. He's basically angry. He's an angry old man, you could say. Uh, because he's in uh, his, his late uh, 80s now and he still travels the world with his story that he's 
angry about the Americans who do not open their UFO files and they don't share the technology of our visitors with the rest of the planet. And um, especially the, the, the last few months, he's been on television on all kinds of stadiums um, telling us in, in extended uh, interviews about what he knows, and it goes very far. He knows about several races visiting our planet. He talks about that he has infra inside information about the technology that is present, which has to do with transport and with energy systems. He knows that the American government is only using their technology for their own benefit, like weapons, of course. And, um, well, he's calling upon every government on the planet to demand a disclosure of the UFO files and sharing this information with the public and the academia. So he's a good guy. Yeah, and that's what I, I saw him. Uh, he, he spoke on the 31st of December on the Canadian mm -hmm. television, and he told the whole story. Yeah, uh, yeah. You are telling me. Um, let's look at the next. Although as Minister of National Defense, um, I had sighting reports uh, of UFOs. Uh, I was too busy to be concerned about them at the time because I was trying to unify the Army, Navy, and Air Force into a single Canadian Defense Force. And that itself was a kind of uh, battle to the finish. So um, this was not high on my agenda. But it, about 10 years ago, I started getting interested uh, due to a young man from Ottawa sending me material on the subject. I told him I was too busy to read it, but he had confidence that someday I would. It took me a while to get around to reading it, but I took it uh, for my summer reading in 2005 and um, was really impressed with what was contained in it. And what I thought to myself is there are huge issues here, huge issues. And the American people and the people of the world have a right to know what's going on because they're part of it. It's not just an isolated thing. I accept the invitation of Victor Vigiani, uh, who's over here somewhere, and his uh, cohort, uh, Mike Bird, to speak to a symposium at the University of Toronto. And uh, I said, UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. That gave me the dubious distinction of being the first person of cabinet rank in the G8 group of company, countries uh, to say so unequivocally. <laughs> in the 1960s sometime, there was a flotilla of UFOs headed south that crossed into NATO territory in Europe. And um, the commander-in-chief of uh, the Supreme Allied, Allied uh, Headquarters in Europe uh, was naturally very shaken. Uh, fortunately, or maybe divine providence, before um, the panic button was pushed, the flotilla turned around and headed back north. Uh, obviously, they had thought maybe they were Russian and they were very concerned about it. Anyway, uh, uh, <clears throat> an investigation was launched into this whole subject and uh, a document was prepared which uh, concluded that at least four species had been visiting Earth for thousands of years. And this is my own uh, view at this stage as well. So, except for that, there are just a couple of um, things that we've talked about that I'd like to refer to. And one was that we were referring to them as they until this morning when Linda Moulton Howe, I think she was the first one, actually named three different species. I don't think we can any more refer them to them as they because they're not an amorphous mass. They are different species and consequently may have different agendas. I don't think we can say that they all have the ag same agenda any more than we could say that the United States, uh, China, and, uh, and Russia had the same ag agenda. Our real interests may be very similar, uh, but as of now, our perceived interests are still uh, quite far apart. 
One more observation before I begin what I want to say, and that is that we spent quite a bit of time talking about the 66-year-old cadavers, and I was glad to have Linda this morning finally say that there are live ETs on Earth at this present time, and um, at least two of them probably working with the United States government. I, the seventh, the other species that I learned about uh, not too long ago was called the Tall Whites. And uh, this is when Paula Harris uh, broke the story just a few years ago. And through her good offices, I had the chance to talk for about three hours with former Airman Charles Hall and uh, listen to this absolutely fascinating story of uh, how he was working with, first of all, he was scared out of his skin, but after that, when he got to know them, how he was working with, and finally they became to trust each other and have a good working relationship with the tall whites at the uh, gunnery range at Indian Springs in Nevada. And these tall whites were living on United States Air Force property and working in cooperation with the United States Air Force and sharing technology with them. He wrote a book, incidentally, called Millennial Hospitality. There are four different versions, but uh, Paula says that uh, Millennial Hospitality uh, number two is the best. I think that's the one I read, and it's a, it's a very interesting read uh, if you want to sort of get inside the, the problem of what it's like to bump into these people floating across the, uh, the terrain in the, in the desert. <coughs> well, enough on that for now. My interest is in full disclosure. And uh, I just, my only caveat is, I think probably I would say 95 to 98 percent full disclosure. I know of one or two things that I'm not sure should be in the public domain, at least yet. They will be someday, I'm sure, but not maybe immediately. But just as children survive uh, the idea of the uh, tooth fairy and Santa Claus when they become adult, I think that taxpaying citizens are quite capable of accepting the new and broader reality that we live in a cosmos teeming with life of various sorts. The fact that some other civilizations are more advanced than we are may be humbling. And it exists. And it's being kept secret by the same vested interests who control our destiny. Who are these vested interests? And what are they up to? Well, Senator, you were talking about a military junta. In my opinion, that is true, but I have broadened and deepened the definition uh, to cabal, and the cabal comprises members of the three sisters, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers, and the Trilateral Commission, the International Banking Cartel, the Oil Cartel, members of various intelligence organizations, and select members of the military unit who together have become a shadow government of not only the United States, but of much of the Western world. The aim of the game is a world government comprising members of the cabal who are elected by no one and accountable to no one. And according to Mr. Rockefeller, the plan is well advanced. Does this help you to understand why our civil rights are being taken away from us? I say us because Canada too is included in the grand plan. So here we are more than a decade later fighting another war that can't be won. There is no country on earth powerful enough to protect its citizens against fanatical hate as we learn from the Boston Marathon. And the mere attempt to pursue the impossible pits neighbor against neighbor and the state power structure against everyone. All of the freedoms won by the millions of men and women who fought and died in World War II are being flushed in unceremoniously down the drain. 
The only hope of peace is a negotiated settlement. This will require a paradigm shift in American attitudes. It involves a de, de facto renunciation of the plan for a new American energy and the adoption of a pledge of cooperation with all humankind to build the kind of world which we are collectively capable of. Young people everywhere need to be challenged by a noble cause. They need to be involved in arresting global warming, creating a banking system that is just and sustainable, and lead the way in the transformation to the new reality that we have to live in harmony with our celestial neighbors as well as seeking peace on earth. In a word, in a word we have to become spiritual beings and practice the one tenet that the world's major religions have in common, and that is the golden rule. <laughs> So what is the significance that someone like Paul Hellyer makes all these statements? Well, it's incredible. And at, at his age, um, of course, he has, maybe he has nothing to lose. But still, his message is not broadcast on Dutch television. This was the citizens' hearing on disclosure. I think it was last year somewhere in May, as I am correct, um, in which testimony was given to former congressmen and women, six of them. And that is very crucial because if you give evidence before Congress, it becomes like um, proof, like when you give evidence before a judge on a crime, then it becomes proof, you can be convicted by testimony. These are former congressmen, so whatever people do there and giving presentations like this, it has no significance because Congress really does not want to hear the testimonies by all these credible witnesses. Paul Hellier is a pilot, he is an aerospace engineer, he has insight in NATO affairs when he was Minister of Defense. He has spoken to many, many more people than you and I probably, uh, you know. Mm. So if he says something like this, I, I'm all ear. You know, but, uh, one of the questions I want to ask him is, um, how would you advise uh, our Minister of Defense, Hennis Plaschuit, uh, concerning how to get as much information about the UFO problem and as soon as possible, what should she, should she d do, you know, to get all the information? She's a puppet. She doesn't know anything. No. <laughs> and, 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 and she has to apply by some rules that we don't know of. Yeah. She is not elected by the people. She is chosen by what he calls the cabal, people who think, well, she's fit for the job because she does what we want. Yeah. Most people in academia don't know anything about UFOs. Most politicians in Holland don't know anything about UFOs, mm -hmm. let alone ministers of the crown. They don't know anything about UFOs. If, and there is, you, you probably are familiar with this psychological issue called, um, uh, um, what do you call it, cognitive dissonance. Yes. That you hear something which is so out of your mind that you just say, well, it can't be true. Yeah. It's, it's not true. I'm not going to listen to it. You're an idiot. Yeah. And we go by these kind of mechanisms in our brain all day long because otherwise we get really upset. If you take his statement literally and you, you think about all the consequences of what he says, then you'll panic. Yeah. You know, that is... Uh Something uh, I think we're almost getting to the end of the of this interview and all the clips. Um, so I had an interview with John Grass, and John Grass he's a movie maker in uh, in in Miami, and I want to try to get him connected with Spielberg. Mm -hmm. I know some people there, and so I I ask him if the disclosure about everything we're talking about, if it doesn't come quickly enough, and then all of a sudden it comes very quick and too fast, then I ask him, what's going to happen on this planet? Mm -hmm. He said, then we have a tsunami. We have a, a, a chaos here. What's, what's your idea about this? 
Well, also what Hellier is doing is, is perfect because he has the uh, stature of a statesman. Uh, he has the audience there. Um, what he says has credibility. But what we are doing, and that's the reason why I wrote my book, my book doesn't show any new information. It just makes existing information um, accessible to people who don't know anything about it, especially maybe academics, but they don't read it because they are already have their mindset on this is just rubbish. So what I think is necessary now is that we, as a people, every one of us, ordinary people, should start to discuss things, ask our politicians, what do you know about it? What are you going to do about it? We, we read this, we heard this, people like Hellier are saying this and that. So we want to get the answers. Because you're right, if, if, if people always ask me, why don't they just land? If, if your UFOs exist and there are aliens there, why don't they just land? Well, the whole Hollywood, what you mentioned, the whole Hollywood was, industry was, was, was used to scare people off of aliens. So people would, would really walk out into the street in sheer panic now. So this is not taken lightly, especially not by the visitors who are probably much more intelligent than we are. We think you can, you can roll out democracy at gunpoint like the Americans did in Iran. Uh, sorry, that's maybe the future, but in Iraq, <laughs> um, we are going to, to get rid of Saddam Hussein for you and we are going to introduce democracy. There are over a million people dead now because of it. This is not the way that visitors, uh, uh, spiritually evolved um, uh, civilizations, go about in the universe. There is this prime directive which says you cannot interfere with other civilizations because you will disturb their, all, their own e evolution, mm -hmm. which is not allowed. It's a universal law. We don't, we don't abide by the laws. We make the laws before, be, before what we want to do with them. Uh, if he talks about the cabal, there, uh, also Eisenhower already warned us in the, in the 50s when he was president of, that he said, well, I, I have a shadow government, which is the military industrial complex, and I don't control it. Also, uh, Kennedy said something uh, similar. So there are mechanisms in our societies globally that don't allow us to know many things, uh, uh, but also especially this is a very explosive dossier. And if this comes open, um, then the whole planet will change. Everything will change. Politics, religions, technology, the way we go about things. We are basically all connected to each other and to everything else in the universe. And we are given the myth, the, 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 the idea that we are separate from anything else and that it is our right to steal from others, to become rich ourselves at the cost of a lot of poors in the world. That's what, what, what this, this is all about here. It's about, uh, it's about control, it's about power. Um, and it's about leaving everybody ignorant, especially academics. Yeah, yeah you also talk about this in this book. Yeah. Your book. Um, do we have any more clips? Yes, one more. One more. Something very interesting is happening right now with the Vatican. We have uh, Corrado Balducci, which is a very close man to the Pope. He was member of the Curia in the Vatican. He was a so-called exorcist for many years, official exorcist of the Vatican. And he has been given interviews to anyone who asks to say that the Catholic Church should accept this phenomenon. Because the Catholic Church has to accept the human testimony because it's based, the religion is based on human testimony. <laughs> then they cannot say this is not true and what we believe is true. It's just about the same. And uh, they are changing drastically their position. I think we're gonna have a big surprise from the church over the next decade. So that was the, uh, the last clip, right? Okay, now what is your uh, impression about this evening, about what is is going to happen or happening right now? 
Well, there's of course a lot of wishful thinking. And um, if you would ask me this question uh, two years ago, I would say it, it would now already have been done, uh, this closure would already be uh, happening. And still now it's 2014. Uh, also, when you talk to these great guys and, and experts in their fields in 2000, you would probably have thought somewhere about 2005 uh, things will, would have changed. Yeah. Especially huh, Obama promised to open the UFO files. Uh, Mosan is talking about the Vatican. Well, we are 14 years later now. Of course, there is more openness in the Vatican that there is probably extraterrestrial life, but it's not like the, the, the Vatican archives have been opened and that we are allowed to see what kinds of goodies are there. No. Um, same goes for America and, and many other countries. Uh, so there's a lot to be done still. And I think the debate, um, first to take this UFO phenomenon seriously, to de debate about it. Don't claim that you know how it, how it really is. D don't claim that you have the truth. Just be open to, well, I don't know, but I can see this and I can speculate on this and that. That we can have a discussion about it. And it's, it's we, the people, the 99% who have to claim our right, as Hellier states it, the people of the world have a right to know what is going on, and we are being kept in the dark. It's, it's, it's the Middle Ages of, 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 of the, the most fantastic um, news of, of, of the millennium. Right. That's what I say too. So this movie has been delivered by Antoine Baudard, a priest, you know him? Yes. Uh, on the 19th of September 2011 in the Vatican, so he lives there too. So I want to deliver this movie plus two others I made on the 21st of March in the Vatican and give it in person to the new Pope, right. Francesco. Let's hope so that he is more open. He, he seems like the, the change that, that was necessary after the last few Popes. Yes. So now, I enjoyed very much the conversation with you. Thank, Thank you very the much. technical people, Martin, Tom, for all your work and Donato and everyone who was involved tonight uh, in the last few weeks to make this all possible. Thank you, Jan Club, Arjen, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to. Thank you. 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 Thank